What's up? What's up? Back at it once again. The Coast Gear Fun Day kicking in for you and for yours. And um, we are here going to do the um the next chapters of this, A Century of Negro Migration by Kurt G. Woodson. Now, what is coming to be important that is um, today on one of the website chat lines I was on and stuff like that, it was reported that a, another political party was going to use the fact that the other political party boosts up illegal immigration over the so-called black vote here in the United States. And a lot of people was like, well, that always been happening here. You know, they always use immigration and things of that nature. Now, for those that have been paying attention to the series, if we go to chapter four, a fight, you know what I'm saying, a fight for migration and stuff like that. <clears throat> when the foreigners came on through, the foreigners being the Germans and the Irish and, you know, and other groups like that, they formed their own stuff. They was not trying to mess around and, you know, they made packs amongst themselves to never to sell to the Negro, don't have no dealings with the Negro. Also, there was a lot of riots and stuff like that because they seen this as competition for the, the jobs they was getting for, you know what I'm saying? So the more immigrants group went and went because they was a white and we was different, you know, so they was European, basically, that's the term we want to use. They basically let them slide on through, you know what I'm saying? And they got their own little racism against us, you know? So they want to sell us goods. They want us out of their city by sundown, out of their, out of their sections by sundown and things like that, you know? So, and then they also joined in with the regular whites, uh, the Anglo-Saxon and English, the, just the Germans and the Irish stuff like that, the burn down temples and all type of stuff like that we had. Right, this is up north where they had riots and things of that nature at. And this is before the Civil War. You know what I'm saying? It's Kurt G. Woodson saying. So this is historically accurate that immigration has never done a great thing for African Americans or so-called African Americans living in America since its inception. So we're going to keep on looking into this, you know, Kurt G. Woodson it says right here, Century and Negro Migration. In chapter five. Now in this chapter right here, we're going to take a look at what, what convinced a, a, a successful, what made a successful migrant. You know what I'm saying? If you like I said, we kept forward with the chapters and stuff like that. Um, black people come to have a surety bond, a five hundred dollar surety bond, make sure there was no trouble, you know. They had to have a white person over them, things of that nature. <clears throat> so we're going to look at what made a successful migrant. The reader will be naturally interested in learning exactly what these thousands of Negroes did on free soil. To estimate these achievements, the casual reader of contemporary testimony would now, as such persons then did, find it easily, decided easily. He would say that in spite of the failing aid which philanthropists gave Blacks, they suddenly kept themselves above want and therefore became a public charge, afflicting their communities with so much poverty, disease, and crime that they were considered lepers of society. The student of history, however, must look beyond these comments for the whole truth. One must take into consideration the fact that in most cases, these Negroes escaped as fugitives without sufficient food and clothing to comfort them until they can reach free soil. Lacking small funds, which the pioneer usually provided himself in going to establish a home in the wilderness, and lacking above all the initiative which slavery had deprived them. Furthermore, these refugees with few expectations had to go in a place where they were not wanted, in some cases a points of which they were driven as undesirables. Although preparations for their coming had sometimes gone to the extent of purchasing homes, and major provisions for employment upon arrival. Several well-established Negro settlements in the North, moreover, were broken up by slave hunters after the passing of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. So the stuff that we build up here, the slave, when they passed the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, they would come to the free black communities in the North and capture more, you know, put them back in bondage. So that would break up the cities and stuff. And the intense, increasing intensity of the hatred of the Negro must be instilled both, too, both as a cause and a result of the intolerable condition. Prior to the 1800s, Negroes of the North were in fair circumstances. Until that time, it was generally believed that whites and blacks 
soon reach an advanced stage of living together on a basis of absolute equality. The Negro had not at this time exceeded the number that could be assimilated by sympathizing communities in that section. The untenable legislation of the South, however, forced so many free Negroes into a wealth crowd of Northern cities during the first four decades of the 19th century that they could not, they could ease not, could not easily be adjusted. The number seeking employment far exceeded demand for labor and thus multiplied the number of vagrants and paupers, many of whom had already been forced into this condition by Irish and Germans, then immigrating to Northern cities. Now we'll take a pause on that. During this time and still today, you know what I'm saying? If he had a, 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 the, the capitalists, the white capitalists had a, an Irish labor, immigrant labor here, or German, and he had this black fugitive labor here, he would pick the white. I mean, that's just a natural thing they would do. At one time, as in the case of Philadelphia, Negroes constitute a small fraction of the population furnish one half of the criminals. So even like, just like today, and it says use the Philadelphia as an example, that even though we made a small fraction of the population, we were still more than half the criminals and vagrants. A radical opposition to the Negro followed, therefore rousing first the laboring classes and finally a names to support the well-to-do people in the press. This condition attained until 1840 and most northern communities until the 1850s and some places where the Negro population was considerable. We must also take into account the critical labor situation during these years. The Northern people was divided as to the way the Negro should be encouraged. The mechanics of the North raised no objection to having the Negroes free and enlightened, but did not welcome them to the section as competitors and the struggling of life. Now, this is, this is a condition about the white liberal. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Because the white liberal has no objection with the Negroes being free and enlightened, but they really don't want you as competitors. You know, a famous speech on that Joe Biden 1994 crime bill speech, where he said they're gonna compete against your son and my son. He was basically doing the same white supremacy jargon. When therefore the blacks converted into a doctrine of training the hand to work with skill began to appear in Northern industrial centers, there arose a formidable prejudice against them. Negro and white mechanics had once worked together but during the second quarter of the 19th century, when labor became more dignified and larger numbers of white persons devoted themselves to skilled labor, they adopted a policy of eliminating the blacks. As I said earlier, if he had to pick the Irish labor between the black labor, the white cap is gonna pick the Irish labor. This opposition to be sure was not a mere harmless sentiment. It tended to give rise to organizational labor groups and then finally to the trade unions and the beginning of those controlling the industry of today. Because it still goes on. These trade unions still do the same thing today. Same thing. This led to the trade unions and they kept blacks out of them. Still sound to this day. Carrying the fight against the Negro still further, these laboring classes used their influence to obtain legislation against the employment of the Negroes in certain pursuits. Maryland and Georgia passed laws restricting the privileges of Negro mechanics, and Philadelphia followed their example. Even in those cases when the Negroes were not disturbed in their new homes on free soil, it was, with the accession of the Quaker and a few other communities, merely an act of toleration. It must not be concluded, however, that the Negro then migrating to the North did not receive considerable aid. The fact to be noted here is that because they were not, were not well received sometimes by people in their new environment, the help which they attained from their friends or far off did not suffice to make up for the deficiency of the community cooperation. This, of course, was an unusual handicap to the Negro, as his life as a slave tended to make him dependent rather than a pioneer. It is evident, however, from the accessible statistics that wherever the Negro was adequately encouraged, he succeeded. So there's statistics he gonna show that when a Negro was adequately encouraged, he succeeded. 
When the urban Negro and northern communities had emerged from their cruel state, they easily learned from white men their methods of solving the problems of life. Their tendency was apparent after 1840, and a striking results of their effort noted long before the Civil War. They showed an inclination to work when the positions could be found, purchase homes, acquire other property, build churches, and establish schools. Going even further than this, some of them, taking advantage of opportunity in the business world, accumulated considerable fortunes, just as had been done in certain centers of the South where the Negroes had been given a chance. In cities far north like Boston, not so much different as the results of this migration notice was noted. Some economic progress among the Negroes had early been observed, and there was a result of a long residency of Negroes in that city, as in the case of Lewis Hayden, who established a successful clothing business. In New York, such evidence was more apparent. There were in the city not so many Negroes as frequent some uh, other northern communities of that time, but enough to make for that city a decidable collection problem. It was a usual situation of ignorant, helpless fugitive and free Negroes going on. They knew not where to find a better country. The situation at times became so grave that it was not only caused prejudice, but gave rise to a tense opposition against those who defended the cause of the Blacks, as in their case of abolition of riots, abolition of riots, which occurred in several places in that state in 1834. So the white folks is running against abolition and they knocking black people. This is 1834 and in the state of New York. To relieve the situation, Gary Smith, an unusually philanthropic gentleman, came forward with an interesting plan. Having large tracts of land in the surf, southeast counties of New York, he proposed to settle on small farms a large number of those Negroes huddled together in congested districts of New York City. Desiring to attain only the best class, he requested the Negroes thus be colonized by recommending by Reverend Charles B. Ray, Reverend Theodore S. Wright, and Dr. J. McClellan Smith, three Negroes of New York City known to be the representative of the best of the race. Upon their recommendation, he decided unconditionally to black men in 1846, 300 small farms in Franklin, Essex, Hamilton, Fullerton, Ohina, and Delaware, Madison, and Uster counties, giving each seller besides $10 to enable him to visit his farm. With these holdings, Black was not only have the basis for economic independence, but will have sufficient property to meet special qualifications, which New York, by law of 1823, required of Negroes to vote. This experiment, however, was a failure. It was not successful because of the inactivity of the land, the harshness of the climate, and in great measure, the inefficiency of the settlers. They had none of the qualities of farmers. Furthermore, having been disab disabled by infirmaries and vices, they could not be as benefactors as answer to the benefactor. Peterborough, the town open to Negroes in this section, did maintain a school, and serve as a station on the Underground Railroad. But agricultural results expected from the enterprise never materialized. The main difficulty in this case was the possibility of substituting something foreign for individual enterprise. Progressive Negroes did appear, however, in other parts of the states. In Pennywine, Western New York, William Platt and Joseph C. Casey were successful lumber merchants. Mr. W.H. Top of Albany for several years one of the leading merchant tailors of the city. Henry Scott of New York City developed a successful pickling business, supplying most of the vessels that enter port. Thomas Dowling for 30 years ran a credible restaurant in the midst of Wall Street banks where he made a fortune. Edward V. Clark conducted a thriving business handling jewelry and silverware. The Negro as a whole, however, moreover, has shown progress. Aided by the government and philanthropic white people, they had before the Civil War a school system with a primary, intermediary, and grammar school and a normal department. 
Then they had a considerable property, several churches, and some limited institutions. In southern Pennsylvania, near to the border between slave, between slave and free states, the Negroes are the affected achievement of these the effects of these achievements of these Negroes was more apparent for the reason that in those urban centers there were sufficient Negroes for one to be helpful to another. All right. So in Southern Pennsylvania, the reason why it, it blew up bigger than it did in New York because there's more black people and it was unified. Philadelphia presented a most striking example of the remaking of these people. Here, the handicap of the foreign element was the greatest, especially after 1830. The Philadelphia Negro, moreover, was further impeded in his progress by the presence of Southerners who made Philadelphia their home, and still more by the predators of those Philadelphia merchants who, sustaining such close relations to the South, hated the Negro and the abolitionists who antagonized their customers. In spite of these untoward circumstances, however, the Negro of Philadelphia achieved success. Negroes who have informally been able to uh, toil upward were still restricted, but they had learned to make opportunities. In 1832, the Pennsylvania Blacks, the Philadelphia, excuse me, the Philadelphia Blacks had 350,000 of taxable property. 350,000 of taxable property. 359,626 in 1837, 400,000 in 1847. These Negroes had 16 churches, 100 Belivering Societies in 1837, and 19 churches and 106 Belivering Societies in 1846. The, the Philadelphia then had more successful Negro schools than any other city in the country. There were also about 500 Negro mechanics, in spite the opposition of organized labor. Some of these Negroes, of course, were native to that city. Chief among those that had accumulated considerable property was Mr. James Fortune, the proprietor of one of the leading selling manufacturers, manufactories, consistently employing a large number of men, black and white. Joseph Casey, a broker of considerable acumen, had accumulated desired property worth over 75,000. Control out of higher, the crowded out of higher pursuits of labor, certain other than enterprising businessmen of this group organized a guild of caterers. This is composed of such men as Bogle, Prozer, Dorsey, Jones, Minton. The aim was to elevate the Negro waiter and cook from the plane of menial to that of progressive businessmen. Then came Stephen Smith, who amassed a fortune of amassed a large fortune as a labor merchant, and with him, Wimple, Vidal, and Prunel. Still in Bowers were reliable coal merchants. Alger, a success in handling furniture, and Bowser, a well-known painter, and William H. Riley, an intelligent bootmaker. There were such, there were a few such successful Negroes in, commun in other communities in the state. Mr. William Goodrich of York acquired an considerable, required a considerable interest in a branch of the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad and sending it to Lancaster. So we got Mr. William Goodrich of York, a black guy who owns part of the railroad of the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad. Benjamin Richards of Pennsylvania amassed a large fortune running a butchering business and buying contracts of droves of cattle to supply various military posts of the United States. So Benjamin Richards of Pittsburgh was supplying the U.S. Army with beef through his butchery. Mr. Henry M. Collins, who started life as a boatman, left the position for speculation in real estate in Pittsburgh, where he established himself as an asset of the community and accumulating considerable wealth. Owen A. Barnett of the same city, Pittsburgh, made his way to discovering the remedy known as B.H. Falkenstein's Celebrated Firmowage, for which he retained the employee of the proprietor and who was exploited the remedy. Mr. John Julius himself, indispensable to Pittsburgh by running the Concert Hall Cafe, 
where he served President William Henry Harrison in 1840. The field of greatest achievement, however, was not in a conservative East where the people were, were well established there going towards an enlightened and sympathetic aristocracy and talent of wealth. It was in the West where men were in position to establish themselves anew and make a life what they thought they would. These cruel communities, to be sure, often ejected the presence of the Negro and sometimes drove them out. But on the other hand, not a few of those centers in the making were in the hands of the Quakers and other philanthropic persons who gave the Negro a chance to grow up with the community when they exhibited the capacity which justified their private efforts in their behalf. These favorable conditions obtained, especially in towns along the Ohio River, where so many fugitives and free persons of color stopped on their way from slavery to freedom. In Steubenville, a number of Negroes had their industry and good department made them helpful to the community, made themselves helpful to the community. Stephen Marbury, who had in the town for 30 years, was in 1835 the leader of a group of 30 free Negroes of color. He had a brick dwelling in which he lived and other property in the city. He made his living as a master mechanic, employing a force of workmen to meet and increase his demand of labor. In Galliopolis, there was another group of this class of Negroes who had permanently attached themselves to the town by acquisition property. Now on the sidebar, remember these guys are not doing it by themselves. They got a group of people that's with them, that's helping them out, you understand me? And the community is backing them, the black community is backing them. All right. They were able to, all right, let me get back to where, where we was at. They were then able not only to provide for their families, but also to maintain a school and a church. In Portsmouth, Ohio, despite Black Friday upheaval in 1831, remember the original Black Friday is the day where they go out on Friday and lynch black people and burn down their houses and stuff like that. The Negro settled down to the solution of the problem of their new environment and later showed an accumulation of property, evidence of actual progress. Among the successful Negroes in Columbus was David Jenkins, who acquired a considerable amount of property as a painter, laser, and paper hanger. One Mr. Hill of Chilcote was for several years its leading tanner and courier. It was in Cincinnati, however, that Negro made the most progress in the West. The migratory blacks came there at times in such large numbers as we have observed, that they were provoked in a hostile class of whites to employ rash measures to exterminate them. But the Negroes, accustomed to adversity, struggled on, endeavoring through schools and churches to embrace every opportunity to rise. In 1840, there were 2,255 Negroes in that city. They had exclusively had, had of the personal effects of 19,000 worth of church property, including over 200,000 worth of real estate. The number of the progressive men had established a real estate firm known as the Iron Chest Company, which built halls for Negroes. One man who had once started unwise to accumulate wealth from which he might be driven had, in 1840, changed his mind and purchased $6,000 worth of real estate. Another Negro paid 5,000 for himself and family and brought a home worth 800 to 1,000 dollars. A free man who was a slave until he was 24 years of age, then had two lots worth 10,000 dollars, paid a tax of 40 dollars, and had 320 acres of land in Mercer County. Another, who was worth only 3,000 dollars in 1836, had seven homes in 1840, 1840. 400 acres of land in Indiana and another tract in Mercer County, Ohio. He was worth altogether 12,000 or 15,000. 15, 12, 15, a woman who was a slave until she was 30 was then worth $2,000. She had come into the potential possession of two houses on which the white lawyer had given her mortgage to secure the payment of $2,000 brought from this thrifty woman. Another Negro who was on an auction block in 1832 had spent 2,600 purchasing himself and family and brought two brick houses worth $6,000 to 
and 560 acres of land in Mercer County, Ohio, said to be worth $252,500. The Negroes in Cincinnati had as early as 1820 established schools developed during the 40s into something like a modern system with Gilmore High School as the capstone. By that time, they had not only had several churches, but had given time and means to organize and promote of such as the Sabbath Schools Youth Society and a total abstinence temperance society and an anti-slavery society. The work for example set by the Negroes of this city was a stimulus to noble endeavor and significant achievement of the Negroes throughout the Ohio and Mississippi Valley. Disarming the enemy, their enemies of the weapon that they would continue to be a public charge, they secure in cooperation, the cooperation of large numbers of white people who at first treated them with contempt. This unusual progress in the Ohio Valley had been promoted by two forces, the development of the steamboat as a factor of transportation and the rise of the Negro mechanic. Negroes employed on vessels as servants to travel in public amass large sums received in the form of tips. Furthermore, a fortunate few consulted the stewards of these vessels could place contracts for, for supplies and use the business method of realizing handsome incomes. Many Negroes thus enriched purchases of real estate and went into business in towns along the Ohio River. The other force, the rise of the Negro mechanic, made was made possible by overcoming much prejudice which had been seen, had been, which had at first been encountered. The great change in this respect had taken place in Cincinnati by 1840. Many Negroes who had been forced to work as many laborers then had the opportunity to show their usefulness to their family and to the community. Negro mechanics were getting as much as skilled laborers as they could do. It was not uncommon for white artisans to solicit the appointment of colored men because they had a reputation of being better paymasters than the master's workers for the favorite race. White mechanics not only worked with the blacks, but often associated with them, patronized the same barbershop, and went to the same places of amusement. Out of this group came some very useful Negroes, among them, among whom may be mentioned Robert Holland, the horseman. A. B. Thompson, the tailor, Jake Presley and Thomas Ball, contractors, Samuel T. Wilcox, the merchant, who was worth 60000 in 1859, and they were among them were two other successful Negroes, Henry Boyd and Robert Gordon. Boyd was a Kentucky freeman who had overcome the prejudice in Louis and Cincinnati against the Negro mechanics by inventing and exploring a coated bed that demanded for which they censored throughout the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. So this guy had been in something, Robert Boyd had been in something that everybody needed. He had a credible manufacturing business which he employed 25 men. Robert Gordon was a much more interesting man. Born a slave in Richmond, Virginia, he ingrained himself into the favor of the master who had placed him in charge of a large coal yard with the privilege of selling the slave for his own benefit. In the course of time, he accumulated a position of hundreds of thousands, a position of thousands of dollars with which he finally purchased himself and moved away to free soil. After deserving the situation of several northern cities, he finally decided to settle in Cincinnati, where he may arrive with $15,000. Knowing the coal business, he well established himself thereafter, and with some discouragement and opposition, he accumulated much wealth and he, which he divested in the United States bonds during the Civil War and in real estate of Walnut Hills when the bonds were later redeemed. Ultimately, the favorable attitude of the people of Detroit towards migrating Negroes had reflected the position of the people of that section had taken time from the earliest settlements. Generally speaking, Detroit adhered to this position, and this continued community prospered many a Negro family. There were the Williams amongst most whom were confined themselves to their trade, bricklaying, and amassed considerable wealth. Then there were the Cooks, descended from Lomax B. Cook 
a broker with little, no little business ability. William Marion Cook, the musician, belonged to this family. The Baptists too were among the first successors, one of the first to succeed in this new home as they prospered materially from their experience and knowledge previously acquired in Fredericksburg, Virginia, as contractors. From this group came Richard B. Dottis, who in his day was the most useful Negro Baptist preacher in the Northwest. The Pelhams were no, well, no less successful in establishing themselves in the academic world. Having an excellent reputation of the community, they easily secured the cooperation of an influential white people in the city. Out of this family came Robert A. Peckham, for years, editor of the Weekly News, or the editor of a weekly in Detroit, from in Detroit, and from 1901 to the present time, an employee of the federal government in Washington. The children of the Richards, another old family, were in no such affair as to descendants of, of the other. The most prominent and most useful to emerge from this group was the daughter, Fanny M. Richards. She was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, October 1st, 1841. Having left that state with her parents, she was quite young. She did not see so much of the antebellum conditions obtaining there. Desiring to have better training than what she was given to the person of color in Detroit, she went to Toronto where she studied English, history, drawing, and needlework. Years later, she attended the teacher's training school in Detroit. She became a public school teacher there in 1863, and after 53 years of credible service in this work, she retired on a pension in 1913. The Negroes in the North had not only shown their ability to rise in the economic world when properly encouraged, but had began to exhibit power of all kinds. There were Negro inventors, a few lawyers, a number of physicians and dentists, many teachers, and scores of intelligent preachers. Some scholars know that even successful Blacks in finer arts. Some of these were Frederick Douglass as the most influential, were also doing credible work in journalism with about 30 newspapers which had developed among the Negroes as a weapons of defense. In this progress of Negroes in the North was much more, was much more marked after the muddle in the middle of the 19th century. The migration of the Negroes to the Northern communities was at first checked by the reaction of those in place during the 30s and 40s. Thus relieved the large influx of which constituted a menace. Those communities gave the Negroes already on one hand, better economic opportunities. It was fortunate too that prior to the check of the infiltration of the, prior to the check and the infiltration of the blacks, they had come into certain districts in sufficient large number to become more potential factors. They were strong enough in some cases to make common cause against foes and could by cooperation solve many problems with which many blacks dispersed conditions could not think of grappling. Their endeavors along these lines proceeded in many cases from well-organized efforts like those accumulating in numerous national conventions, which had begun meeting first in Philadelphia in 1830. And after some years of deliberation in this city, extended to others in the North. These bodies aim not only to promote education, religion, and morals, but taking up the work which the Quakers began, they put forth efforts to secure free Black opportunities to be trained in mechanic arts and equip themselves with participation in industry, thus springing up throughout the North. This movement, however, did not succeed in proportion to the efforts foot forth because of the increasing power of trade unions. So back to the immigration again, you know what I'm saying? So while we doing this, we get these nation building skills we're building up, the white folks kept on building up their trade unions. And as it started getting more solidified with the companies and stuff like that, as they build up the industries and the companies kept on start dealing with the trade unions, they start casting the blacks off. After the middle of the 19th century, too, the Negroes found the conditions a little more favorable to their progress than a generation before. The aggression itself had it that by that time, so shaped the policy of the nation as not only to force free states to cease aid and escape fugitives, but to undertake to impress the Northern into service of assisting the recapture 
as provided in the field of the state law. This repressive measure set in large numbers of people thinking of the Negro as a national problem rather than a local one. The attitude of the North was then reflected in personal liberties laws as an answer to this measure and increasing sympathy for the Negroes. During this decade, therefore, more was done in order to secure the Negroes better treatment and to give them more opportunities for improvement. And there you have it. And there you have it, a Negro migrant, a successful Negro migrant. But one of the keys to being a successful Negro migrant was Black unity. We had to depend on each other and we had to depend on us. And because they wasn't getting the jobs, you know what I'm saying, we had to bounce that skill off of us. You know what I'm saying? So let's say this is today's turn, you know what I'm saying, we got a Black electrician here, so he would come by my house and fix it up, but he, you know, he wouldn't tax me, you know, like that. And I'd turn him again with some, some money for that and turn his name on again to somebody else, Black, in the community that need help. So that way we kept the shit bouncing among ourselves and the money and stuff like that. And in turn, the Black nutrition would take that money and help build the Negro school. You feel what I'm saying? So more kids can learn into the trade, reinforcing each other in the community, reinforcing the self. That's something we don't do today now in today's situation. You know what I'm saying? We know what it is, but it's something we don't do today. You know what I'm saying? We just deal with the drama and think that we're doing this as individuals, where it's not like that. No economic system worked individually. You know what I'm saying? Even though he named out individual people out there, he still had people around him that was helping him out and helping him bounce the money around. You know, it comes back to what Dr. Carl Anderson says about how the money, how many times the dollar touches in the black community. You know what I'm saying? Then compared to other communities and how many times that dollar busts around and get touched around, you know? It get touched around because, let's say in the Jewish community, for instance, you know, they can't touch the food unless it's kosher. So that's one business unto themselves. You know what I'm saying? Somebody had to, the rabbi got to cut the meat and bless it and all type of stuff. They ain't going to have no regular Joe Blow do that. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be somebody from their community that's going to do that. And that's how they keep on keep the money bouncing. One of the reasons why how they keep the money bouncing in in their community. Anyway, it's a Coast Gift Fun Day. You know what I'm saying? Sign up for more. We're going to keep on doing this. We're going to keep on moving like this. Um, come back with Chapter 6. You know, getting a lot of reviews on this from other places, stuff like that. Much love. But we'll come back in Chapter 6 and see how this book still relates to us today. The works of Kurt G. Woodson, A Central of Negro Migration.